Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks. It's been a little while. I am here with a bunch of knuckleheads. One by the yeah, name yeah, of yeah. <laughs> one by the name of Marco Cipetta. Hello, hello. And uh, one by the name of Paul Lilly. I have to mute the live stream because that really messes with my head. Paul, he was the uh, curly sounding guy. You may have heard him just a minute ago. And then Chris is the man behind the curtain, and I am Dave Altavilla. Your uh, your uh, mildly um, misguided host, I think. I will point out, I'm actually in front of the curtain today. Oh, are you on screen with us? Yes, I am. Oh, he's he's also turning the dials and tweaking the knobs. So self promotion. <sighs> there you go, Chris. There you go, shameless buddy. That's good. That's good. We like to see that. Um, but uh, it's it's been a while since our last cast, and we have a lot to talk about. Um, both in the land of mobile stuff and PC uh, enthusiast stuff and uh, workstation and all kinds of great technologies going on these days. We are uh, short on sleep and heavy on, on the tech, which is just fine. Um, but uh, let's, uh, let's dive right in. What do you hey, say? Hey, we what? start early. Right on, right on cue. The... <laughs> Sorry about that, <laughs> folks. We will, um, we will pull the battery. Right on time. Right on time, buddy. Beautiful. All right. uh, yeah, that's okay. You know, uh, actually, before we dive in, I haven't asked you guys how are you doing because I'm concerned for your welfare. Marco, um, clearly your your um, telephone communication setup is working okay. How's everything else? Um, everything is as as uh, as good as can be expected. I'm I'm keeping positive despite a lack of sleep. A new puppy that's uh, driving me a little nuts. Kids home from school and all that fun stuff uh, and lots of work. Beautiful. That sounds like good problems to have. That's yes. to say, Paul. Paul, how about you? Are, are you having good problems? I am. Ex- I'm having no problems right now, so I am good. I am no good. Problemo. No problemo. Excellent, Chris. Chris, you've got a fashionable set of cans on. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what sort of audio gear are you rocking over there? Uh, I think they're Sennheiser two nice O I don't know. What are they? Sen- what? What? Sennheiser two O twos. I think. I don't know. They were cheap. They sound good. See them. No complaints. How are, thing, how are things in God's country, Maine? Doing good. I am uh, getting a little bit of signal issues with your stream. Marco and Paul seem to be fine, but you're breaking up just a little bit. So, uh, oh, really? Yeah. Well. So you can't blame it on me this time. No, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm seeing me pretty good. Maybe, I don't know. Although the, uh, the live stream seems frozen right now, at least on YouTube, from what frozen. I can see. Uh, Not working for me. Is it working? Yeah. I think you Weird. need to stop your your torrents or whatever you got going. Yeah, you know what? I'll I'll get the get the gerbils off the treadmill. No problem. Um, hey, let's dive in. Let's let's keep on trucking here and talk about some of the latest stuff that we've seen, and there's quite a bit of it. Um, Samsung's Galaxy Note 8, a uh, hands-on at Samsung's Unpacked 2017 in New York City. Uh, Marco and I spent the day with the folks at Samsung uh, yesterday, actually, and it was uh, quite the event. Um, probably one of the best uh, dressed, I guess, best uh, orchestrated sh- uh, shows, launches I've seen in a long time. The stage was amazing, uh, all lit up. It was a- an entire theater from-, from floor to ceiling, actually, with you know video streaming in and from all angles. And just wild stuff, right, Marco? I mean, that was a production and a half. I was, I mean, it, and it was really slick. It was like very well done. I thought. Am, am yeah, I, if I if I was able to get in, it would have been awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I got I got in after the fact. I got in for the hands on part, but um, it was the, Samsung did overbook it, and I was at the end towards the end of the line. So some people didn't get a chance to see what was happening on the stage. But once the stage opened up, um, I did slip in there for the hands on and get some time with the phone. Yeah, that, they, that, they do put on a good show. That's for sure, though. Yeah, no, that stage was cool. I mean, you know, we, we you always see these these stages with you know the the single screen behind everybody and you know the the backdrop going and all the slick animations and stuff like that. But this thing was all around the talent, if you will, or the uh, Samsung executives were actually walking on top of the uh, the video feed because it was built into the floor, built into the wall behind them, um, you know, all the way up to the ceiling. It was really really cool, very well done. Um, but but 
you know, I guess it's not about the glitz and glamour and more about uh, the substance, and, and that would be the phone itself. Uh, Galaxy Note 8, a 6.3-inch device, uh, which you would think would be mammoth, but it is not because of the infinity display that Samsung has built that actually uh, fits a whole lot of screen real estate in the palm of your hand. Um, I mean, it's still a large device, but it's not as large as you might think for a 6.3-inch device. 6.3-inch, 2960 by 1440 display. Uh, OLED, Super AMOLED, of course, and so that thing is beautiful. Uh, six gig of RAM, Snapdragon 9, uh, 835, excuse me. Uh, six gig of RAM, 64, and 128 gig is a storage. Uh, the S Pen has been amped up. We've got dual cameras in the back now. Um, really, a well built, well appointed device. Marco, what were your first impressions? What did you think? First impressions, as soon as you touch it, it feels like a really premium, nice device. Um, if um, if you were waiting for a, a super high-end premium Note device, this is it. Um, it is, it's gorgeous. It does feel nice in the hand. If you like the S8, you will most likely love the Note. Um, more screen, it's just a touch bigger. If you come see our hands-on, we actually have some comparisons to the S8. I mean... It's just a touch bigger. It's not that much bigger. And um, in addition to the to more memory, one of the reps there, I'm not 100% sure he was correct, said it's also faster memory. So once some full reviews come, he said expect potentially 20% better performance in some scenarios too. So looking like a strong device. The only, um, the only caveat, um, actually a smaller battery than the S8 Plus. So I'm sure there were some power optimizations to be made. But battery life couldn't, may not be as good as an S8 Plus. We have to test it to be sure. Yeah, yeah, that'll be interesting to see. There's, there's a lot you can do with memory, and it does have six gig of RAM now. <laughs> um, so there's a lot you can do with memory and, and power and, and things of that nature. Well, and to be fair, um, the uh, the S8 Plus had pretty insane battery life for a flagship yeah. phone. It was a yeah, battery a monster, battery. one of the best. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so it will be. You know, I, I can tell you when, when we were demoing the thing, um, you know, on on uh, on video, it was I, I was just hitting apps left and right, and it just was popping everything open. I mean, nothing stuttered. Um, it was all over LTE connectivity, and God knows there were literally thousands of phones in the room, probably all connected on on various networks. Um, but this thing was fast, um, impressively so. I don't, I don't, you know, I guess I. I at first wasn't looking for it, but then I realized, wow, every time I hit an app and, you know, when you're when you're demoing on camera, you're, you're always, you know, leery of the demo that fails. Right. Um, well, this time the demo was lickety split. And so, um, yeah, I, I think performance is looking good and and build quality is looking good. There was some knocks from some of some folks out there, some other tech analysts and reviewers that it was an S8 plus. Uh, with a pen, you know, it was too too much like the SA Plus. I don't know if that's fair, you know. I mean, it, internally, it's the same SOC, but you know, you do have a different screen, slightly different form factor, um, the additional features that come with the pen. It's not just a hardware feature, the S Pen. There is lots of of software additions as well that come with it with the S Pen. I mean, I could see why someone would say that if you were trying to explain to a layperson what the note was. You would say it's like an S8, but with stylus support. But it, it, it's a different device. I mean, the people that use that use the Note, that love the Note, understand why versus a standard smartphone that it is different. Yeah, yeah. There was some uh, there's some pretty cool features. What was the one with the um, active uh, emoji and active drawing that you can text? I forget the the lingo they used for it. The yeah, brand I, name I, I'm missing. I, I don't remember. Again, I wasn't in there for the for the Prezo, so I don't remember what they called that. Some of that stuff. Yeah, no, th th there was some pretty cool stuff. They they have um, some new camera technology now. So now you've got dual rear-facing cameras, uh, one telephoto, one wide-angle lens, both 12 megapixel, front-facing 8 megapixel camera. The the dual rear cameras can do some pretty pretty neat uh, stuff. You can set up a shot to uh, essentially take um, three photos. So you have your standard you know full view shot, all crisp. Um, you know the entire scene. Then you have this uh, telephoto um, zoom shot that brings the fore foreground uh, into you know full complete focus and sharp, and then blurs the background. And then you can do another wide angle shot, I believe, as well. 
Um, so th there's lots of different um, setups with the camera, with those dual rear cameras, um, and just an, an impressive device. Expensive, 950 and up. Uh, I think um, you know it's been listing between 950 and 970. Um, Paul, Chris, what do you guys think about this? It's is it is it too big? Is it too expensive? Is it is it too sexy for you? Well, I can't say it's too <laughs> big. I was a very proud Nexus Six user, and that despite the technically smaller screen at five point nine nine inches or whatever that was, I'm sure it's a bigger device than the Note Eight is. Uh, I haven't compared the dimensions side by side, but I'm sure Samsung's made it nice and thin with tiny bezels. So. Uh, I can't really complain about the size at all. Give me more size, and I'll take yeah. it. Um, I think I'm most interested in seeing how well the background blur bit plays out, because, of course, we've all seen like the iPhone with its portrait mode, and you know you can get really nice shots with it, really nice background blur looking, and then sometimes you get shots that just look alien with foreground and background objects coming in and out. So I want to see if Samsung has been able to nail down that depth d detection with it and get some really nice results or not. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can tell you from what we saw, you know, you know, demoing it, and we actually demoed it on camera, and it probably doesn't do it justice on, on the video, but um, the pictures we saw were actually pretty good. I mean, that, that foreground was crisp. Um, you do get that, you know, that, that effect, that nice bokeh effect of background blur. Um, you know, but yeah, it, it's going to be one of those things where you're going you're gonna to fire it up, you're going to you're going to pull up the uh, the images, take some screenshots, and then uh, you know pour over the pixels and get get snobby about it um, to uh, to ascertain the quality. But yeah, it's I mean it's it's unique. I mean, and there's a couple of other uh, phones out there that have done similar things. Of course, um, Huawei's had uh, dual cameras in the back for a little bit, but um, but this adds something to the note as well. Paul, what do you what do you think about this device? Is this is this your kind of jam? Still running Android, right? Oh yeah. I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> Says the iPhone yeah. guy. I'm yeah, I'm that guy. Paul. No, but but what do you think about the price? Do you really think it's worth nine fifty and up? Is it is it that much better? You know, I'll be honest with you, I probably wouldn't step up to a phone of that cost personally um i go through them too quickly and you know i'm the type of guy that likes to you know as soon as the next soc comes out then you know the latest features come out i want to jump on that next generation technology so i'd probably hold off i know there's a lot of folks in this camp though that enjoy that that phablet um you know with what stylus form factor and the note you know uh following the the the, the note faithful i guess um, so, but the other thing you have to remember here is that we're hearing that Apple's next generation iPhone is going to start kissing up to the thousand dollar price point as well. So who knows? Maybe, uh, you know, Samsung's getting out ahead of it for the, uh, for the money grab here, right? <laughs> well, that's more than your upfront cost too. Cause a lot of these phones, mm -hmm. especially the iPhone will carry a great resale value. So even if you are trading up phones ever here and there, if you know, you pass it off on one of the many websites for for reselling phones, you know, you can probably get a pretty good value out of the Note 8 three, six months down the road. Yeah, yeah. AeroCloud in the comments says, non-replaceable battery is a no-go for me. I hated the Note 5 for that reason alone. And we should stop calling these phones and should start calling them handheld computers with tiny screens capable of making phone calls. <laughs> you know, that, that's that's a good point. It is. It really is because people talk about you know the PC is dead and dying. The PC is just morphed into a different form factor, like it has been for forty years. You know, yeah. th th these are PCs. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a supercomputer in your pocket in some respects. I mean, the, the the type of force power we have in our pockets these days would fill a room. You know, they are. But I, I have a hard time wrapping my head around the prices starting to go up with each new generation instead of down. Because the, even though we can consider them PCs, we're not doing real work and then we're still using them to you know post uh our lunch pics on facebook and you know text our friends or snapchat or whatever versus okay. what you're doing on the pc yeah so yeah. so in that regard it's i don't know yeah price needs to come down not go up i think a lot of why yeah, i, I love them moto z <laughs> yeah you're, you're looking at that right now right chris yeah is this the is the, the moto z2 play play yeah that With is going to be a bat battery behemoth Oh yeah, uh, yeah. So, 
in in rough testing it's not benchmarking as well in battery as original z play but in real use i'm still getting uh 10 of battery life per hour of screen time which is like 10 hours of screen time on a charge so it's still insane not too shabby yeah not too shabby paul paul you make a good point though i mean um i think there's there's a, a place and certainly in the market um you know the bulk of the handsets if we looked at the price points are probably south of five hundred dollars or or around five hundred dollars and and under um you know you, you you look at some of the offerings that are out there off contract unlocked um and it, and it can be done um, but when you talk about a device that has like a, you know, Wacom digitizer built in, I mean, you've got lots of different um, technologies in this phone, six gig of RAM, um, you know, a, a larger display, a larger battery, everything's bigger about it. I mean, you can see the justification, but yeah, is it is it a $1,000 uh, worth of technology? Hard to make that case when you think about a powerful laptop, right? In that price range, which you, you know, get for a $1,000 Ultrabook. You guys want to see a thousand dollars worth of computing technology that fits in the palm of your hand? <laughs> Show us, Marco. Ooh. There it is. That, that's a good segue, buddy. Good job. <laughs> yeah, good job. So yeah, let's let's talk about that, and uh, we will be. We will you guys be... have anything else to say? I just I figured it was a good uh, a good spot to show off something really cool. No, that's good. That's good. Let, let, we'll we'll transition to that, but um, yeah, we'll be we'll be firing up the full review on. Um, the Samsung Galaxy Note 8 very soon in the weeks ahead. Uh, we are expecting a review unit in shortly, and uh, so stay tuned for that. You can check out our uh, live hands-on demo from the event, which is up on the site right now. And then we will shift gears hard to a 16-core beast of silicon called AMD's Ryzen Threadripper. Uh, 1950X, 1920X, we did a full review on that bad boy. Um, 16 cores, 32 threads, uh, $1,000 processor. And Marco, you had the pleasure of testing it. What do you think? Is it worth 1000 bucks, Marco? Um, you know, <laughs> in, in, in the current landscape, $1,000 is a bargain for the chip. But now, it's not a bargain. $1,000 is a lot to pay for a processor. But when you consider Intel's 10-core chip is $1,000 right now, and in multi-threaded workloads, Threadripper basically annihilates it um, in anything that's going to utilize all the cores, yeah, I mean, it's worth it. So I'm not sure if this comes across well on my, my webcam. Let me see if I can get the angle just right. Can you guys see that this one's mm -hmm. etched with, uh, with the hot hardware logo on there? Is yeah. that cool? Just so this, one, this yeah. one's dead. So nobody make fun of me for touching it. Ooh, Threadripper, blah. It's um, this one's already dead. So don't get mad at me. But yeah, so uh, really kick-ass processor. So what what's underneath this heat spreader is essentially two eight-core uh, Ryzen dies. There's four pieces of silicon under here, but only two of them are active uh, active dies. And yeah, so you either have the 16-core configuration, the 1950X, um, you know, which is eight cores per, uh, per die, or you have the um, the 12-core configuration in the 1920X, um, which is, I, I think I screwed up the math on the last one, whatever, but six six core per die, and each core supports two threads, so up to 32 threads on the 1950X, up to uh, 24 threads on the 1920X, <clears throat> and the 1920X is only well, only a $799 processor. Only. Now, on, on top of that, you have now the brand new uh, X399 motherboards, so AMD now has all these really beautiful, high-end, killer, fully modern motherboards to go along with it, and now you have these super premium processors with super premium motherboards, that offer kick-ass multi-threaded performance at, although they are relatively high prices, they are super competitive, competitively priced versus Intel. So Threadripper is a is a win-win-win to me. Yeah, man. That is a big slab of silicon. Um, competitively priced. What, what, do, what, do you, what did you see for, you know, caveats with this thing? I mean, obviously you're talking about serious power consumption. Um, you know, I, I was doing more thinking about power consumption. It's, okay, it's really not right. So let, let, let me let me just burn through. If you were to, if you were to speculate on Threadripper's performance, right, yeah. knowing what you knew about <laughs> Ryzen and knowing that it's the same die, you would say you know single and lightly threaded stuff. It's going to trail Intel because IPC is not quite as high as Intel's latest stuff, and Intel has higher clocks typically. Mm -hmm. And but for multi-threaded, 
you'd say Threadripper kicks butt because it has all these compute re resources. And that's exactly what we saw. So for lightly threaded stuff, Intel's still out in front. For a heavily multi-threaded like Cinebench, the 3D Mark physics test, Pavre, anything, you know, rent, 3D rendering, anything that can use all of these cores, it kicks really much butt. You know, for example, Ryzen uh, much 1950, butt. 1950X scored over 3,000 in Cinebench R15, whereas a 7900X is, is 2,100, not even 2,200. And then you overclock it and it gets to like 3.2. But now to, I was thinking about power, that lots of people said, oh, power was high. And if you look at our, our power graph, right? The 1950X, the, the whole system, not just the chip, pulled 290 watts from the wall with just a processor under load, okay? The 7900X, was only 245 watts. So you're like, wow, you know, 50 watts more. 50 watts more for 60% more cores. Right, right, yeah. So yeah. Who, if, if the 7900X was doing 245, <laughs> let's see what the 18 core Intel chip does, and then we can see where how power consumption really looks on Threadripper. After right. I sat back and digested, peak power didn't look so bad. Now, idle power was high. Idle power was 100 over 100 watts on the Threadripper system. Yep. And uh, the Intel system was 66 watts, and I initially thought something was wrong, so I reached out to AMD, and got an explanation that basically, the, you got to up all those pins. Well, the comp that yeah. and and the other explanation is it really doesn't throttle down very much. They try to stay at that base clock as much as possible to keep responsiveness and performance high. Uh, so gotcha. That's really what it is. You, they could have dropped it down to 700 watts, but now you have to fire up 16 cores back up to you know whatever clock in it. You know, you end up with more latency there. So, yeah, yeah. So, what what do you think about this this product from a uh, end user use case perspective? Um, this is a obviously a um, content creation, you know, workstation professional, you know, workhorse, you know, supercharged machine. Um, what about for the average enthusiast who likes the game, who likes to, you know, maybe they've got some some heavier duty tasks as well. Um, but they might not be, you know, super, you know, multi-threaded in terms of their everyday workload. Is this thing, you know, just just due to its price, performance, um, you know, advantage versus Intel, um, is this thing for everybody, or is this still a niche, high-end niche product? It's it's a high-end niche product, but like if you just if you just want a game, and you know, and have. Um, <clears throat> All right, I'm, uh, let me not use that phrase. If you just want to, if you want the best of the best and want to game on it, yeah, it's probably not the best choice, right? So you're better off saving a ton of money and getting something like a 7700K or a, you know a Ryzen 7, and putting all the rest of the money into a GPU. Now, with mm. that said, the other advantages of 399 in this platform is you get like a ton of PCI Express connectivity, so you can have you know bunch of NVMe SSDs hanging off of here, multi GPUs without any kind of switches or added latency, you can build a killer rig. But it's really for creators and, and people that run apps or have workloads that will use all the cores. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting. Um, it's it's definitely a, a, a powerful product with a place in the market. It's it's something that we love to see, you know, we're performance enthusiasts. And so more cores, is is good um paul chris what are your thoughts on this on this thing <laughs> if, if uh, i'm going for it and i'm building a, a high-end machine and i want all those cores i to me i think it's a no-brainer to go with uh, amd over intel at this point i mean you're getting you get more cores for your buck you're getting all those pcie lanes yeah um you getting lower price overall to me uh, that that's the way to go right now yeah, yeah, Chris. I know what Chris's reaction is going to be because I was actually with him when we were setting up that uh, uh, mega tasking demo where we were gaming, streaming, encoding, restreaming, and recording all at once. Like you know, we were just trying to crush the machine, and it just like laughed at us, right? Yeah, it, it can definitely handle pr more than I could throw at it, and that's definitely not a bad thing. It was incredible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, now that was cool. We we did that little demo. Stop by the site if you if you get a chance to check that out. We also have it up on YouTube where, you know, we're 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 doing your basic Twitch streamer, heavy duty use case, where you know again you're gaming at uh, you know, 1080p, um, you know, high Four, frame rate. 4K gaming. 
4K Ultra 4K. Gaming, streaming at 1080p, 60 FPS. Oh, no. oh, yeah, we, we were rendering a video at 4K, uh, yeah. 60 FPS, I think. Um, and yeah, it just didn't care. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So did we, we have a couple of questions um, or a couple of comments um, from from the chat. Mm-hmm. Um, wait for 8700K, don't, wait, don't waste money on the 7700K. Yeah, I guess it's not going to be a huge difference. Um, can you use Threadripper in dual sockets? Not Threadripper, but it's basically an Epic CPU. You can yeah. get a 2P Epic setup. Um, I don't think there's any workstation motherboards out yet, though, for that kind of setup. Um, another plus is using ECC RAM. That's correct. Yep, I think that's about it. All of the above, yeah. The, the one above that's a good question, though, about if you're streaming while gaming. Um, yeah. Could you justify jumping up to Threadripper at that point, or could you? So, still, what do you think? Do you still get away with that on on Ryzen? So, if you're serious about streaming, yes. Um, a lot of the big streamers are actually using a second rig that just handles their encoding. Yeah. So they're gaming on one system, piping out the uh, through HDMI or whatever into a capture card on the other, and running off that or some similar setup. Um, with Threadripper, at least currently. I see no reason why you can't just do that all in one setup. And oh, yeah. when you're looking at the cost of two systems versus one system with Red Ripper, there's definitely a value proposition there. Um, yeah. So there's some other quality of life things that you can still get with having a second rig, separation of audio, and you know controlling channels and all that. Um, but for a lot of people, one one system setup is a lot easier, and it still gives a fantastic result. Yeah, yeah. When you even even like a nineteen twenty X, a twelve twelve core chip, you're, you're gonna have you're gonna have plenty of resources going on there. I mean that 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 sixteen core chip, the nineteen fifty X, just. I think we what, what was the max CPU utilization we saw in that scenario it was like thirty percent. Yeah, like thirty percent. And what we didn't point out in that video is I was actually connected into the system with Team Viewer while this was going on as well, and Team Viewer yeah. has its own impact on there, so. How much RAM, uh, James asks, how much RAM is recommended for Threadripper? Are there really any benefits with more than 32 gigs of RAM? So that's going to depend on your workload. There are benefits to using four sticks to get the true um, quad channel configuration, just simply have more bandwidth. Um, if you, you know, if you're using apps that are going to use 32 gigs, yes. For most people, I'm going to say no. More than 32 gigs is probably not necessary. Um, but the uh, Infinity Fabric that links all the cores that that clock speed is determined by the RAM speed. So the fastest quad core kit you can afford is probably the best setup for Threadripper. There you go. Yeah, fast memory does help uh, Does help Ryzen in general. Um, so yeah, um, any, other, any other thoughts, words of wisdom on this platform, guys? Yeah, AMD, send me five more, please. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what. What, what's exciting uh, for sure is that Intel is actually, you know, I think what we've seen, you know, and maybe maybe this is giving AMD too much credit, but I don't think so. Intel is actually beginning to react to AMD's competitive threat. You know, they're, they're stepping up their game a little bit now, too. And we're seeing a little bit more aggressive release of Skylake X um, and, and some, you know, forward-looking... Um, announcements, whether it be next generation technology like, um, you know, Coffee Lake, um, you know, we're, we're just getting a lot more communication from Intel in, in terms of what the roadmap looks like and mm-hmm. what seems like a little bit more push on the, on the uh, release side as well. So nothing but good stuff for consumers when, when the competition is uh, cranked up a notch, right? Absolutely. <clears throat> All right, let's, uh, let's move on to um, another AMD topic where they hope to crank up competition a little bit more. Uh, this time, hopefully, for, for AMD versus NVIDIA. And that is Radeon RX Vega 64. You know, guys, we need less clacky keyboards and less clicky mouses. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, we just had one of the uh, one of the guys in chat commenting about that. Um, but, yeah. Let's, Mechanical let's master race. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> you really can't beat the tactility. So, yeah, if you're an enthusiast, you may have to put up with some noise here on this webcast. Um now let's let's move on to uh, Radeon RX Vega 64 and 56. This is the the new class of product uh, graphics products from AMD that was just introduced uh, back on August 14th. We have a full review up of both cards. 
Uh, Marco and I spent uh, time beating the heck out of these things. Um, I actually did the benchmark testing on it. I can tell you, um, it's 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 a a bit of mixed emotion for me, to be honest. <laughs> um, we've got we've got finally a, a product from AMD that uh, can compete with Nvidia's top end uh, GPUs, uh, GTX 1080 class, GeForce GTX 1080 class product um, for competitive pricing. Um, you know, 499 for Radeon uh, RX Vega 64, 399 for 56, at least from what we've seen um, or what we were told for MSRPs. Um, a couple of caveats. You've got a little bit more power draw, a little bit more noise. Um, you've got, uh, on, the, on the positive side, you've got um, a little bit more DX12 throughput, a little bit better async compute um, performance in certain game titles that are optimized well for DX12 that are sort of built from the ground up versus ported. Um, for example, Tom Clancy's uh, The Division showed some significant strength, actually 10% uh, faster than a 1080 was the, the Vega 64 in that game, just because of its DX12 prowess. Um, but again, power draw <clears throat> and heat, um, these things are you know, Vegas 64 is kind of a nuclear reactor. I'm just going to say it like it is. It is, it is a big, power-hungry beast. Um, that HBM2 um, eats, eats some power, for sure. Um, offers a lot of bandwidth. And then the other thing that, you know, again, I was a little disappointed by, by AMD, you know, again, great kudos for that performance. Kudos for making these cards available at price points that are very competitive versus NVIDIA. Where's, to, where's the supply in the channel? There's not enough supply. We were getting lots of reports of distributors uh, and resellers um, jacking up cost because supply was tight and, and they were gouging. And there was even rumors flying around that, you know, this was just an introductory price for, for Vega 64 and that AMD can't even maintain that price moving forward. They, they made a statement on that and said, that's not true. We're going we're gonna to have more $499 straight up Vega 64s on air. Um, so a little bit of trouble on supply, a little bit of power and heat to, to deal with. Not exactly clean, but we've got an architecture here that can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of NVIDIA's best stuff. What do you think, Marco? I'm, I'm trying to be fair. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's fair. It's not a little bit more power. It's a lot more power. A lot more power. <laughs> it's a lot more power. Yeah. So like in, in, in a bubble, um, yeah, you have a card with an MSRP that's competitive with the 1080, it, it, with the RX Vega 64, yeah. um, that uses more power, generates more heat. Yeah. The RX 56 looks like the real winner. Um, the Vega, yeah, the Vega, the, I'm, I'm all discombobulated. The Vega RX 56 looks like the winner because that card at 399 MSRP is clearly the winner versus 1070. Power is higher, but it's not crazy. So the problem, though, is you're correct. You can't find them. Um, supply is so low, prices are getting jacked up. It causes a lot of the same, sort, of, sort of the same thing that happened with, with the Hawaii launch. Lots of ill yeah. will towards AMD. Right. The other thing is, you know, I, the GTX 1080 launched in May of last year. Right. So it's in that regard that I mean, it's nice that AMD is playing in this space again. Um, but they're competing with the chip that's a year and a half old, and, and that's an eternity in, in internet time, you know. In, in that's the biggest decade. disappointment to me because you know the supply issue. I, I give AMD a pass for now because you know the cryptocurrency mining craze just has the graphics market just Upside all topsy turvy right yeah. now. So that, yeah. that's an issue for everybody. <clears throat> um, if it lingers, then then I'll knock AMD for that. But I mean, really, it's this is a product that's competing with its competition, Nvidia Pascal, which came out last year or more than a year ago and it's not maybe if it would have brought parity to the 1080 ti or beat that i'll feel a little different but it's you know it's their top parts running neck and neck with the 1080 and that's you know that's over a year old at that point so to me it's not all that exciting it's nice to see amd at least have a product in the high end uh this time around but you know yeah 
Um, uh, Apev, if I have that name correctly, uh, says Vega 64, roughly GTX 1070, roughly equal to, I assume, is what he means. Vega 56, excuse me. Um, and the answer to that is actually Vega 56 is consistently faster than a GTX 1070. So, again, that $399 price point for Vega 56 and a GTX 1070 AMD has the clear advantage. I don't know how much longer you'll see 1070s, you know, listing for full boat. It depends on the mining community, I think, snapping those things up because those are pretty sought after by the mining folks. But yeah, it's it's a faster card. Again, at the trade-off, at the expense of significantly more power draw and and heat, <clears throat> and and a little bit of noise, a little bit of fan wine to go with it. So, um, but it's a solid card, no question about it. Vega 56 to me, Marco. I don't know if you'd agree with this. Seemed like you know, a little bit firmer footing for AMD. Yeah, absolutely. Like that's a, a win in that space. But you know, again, it's it's a win against a, an an older competitor. Yeah, yeah. Chris, your thoughts before we move on? For as long as we've been hearing about Vega coming, it it is kind of disappointing that it's only this far. But I mean, they're only a year, year and a half behind Nvidia now in GPUs, so. They are gaining ground. Uh, I guess we'll just have to see what the future brings. Yeah. So we, we, we have a couple comments about Vega shipping shipping with too much voltage. Um, that's a really simplistic view of, of the cards. Um, AMD shipped cards that needed that voltage to stay stable, period. Otherwise, they would have shipped them at lower voltages. Now, you can get samples in undervolt and save power and even maybe get higher clocks even at those lower voltages so you're not sucking a ton more power to get that additional performance but that's not going to be the norm across every card otherwise every card would have shipped that way so the aftermarket cards it might be a different story when where the board partners do their tweaks and add you know better more capable coolers we'll see what happens but the fact of the matter is it's a it's a modern forward-looking gpu and it's really nice for AMD to have it in their stable, but it's it's competing with a year and a half old card. That's yeah. way low power. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and then Tuan points out something interesting. He says, "How much ground will they lose once Volta arrives?" And that's really the that's really the problem of of competing versus, um, you know, uh, a la essentially a, a current generation product that's mature been out in the market with your competitor for for over a year. Uh, yeah, when when Volta arrives, you know, your, your assumption is. You know, NVIDIA is going to take it up another notch again. And, um, you know, I, I find it interesting, though, too. <laughs> Clearly, NVIDIA hasn't gone HBM to, or HBM in general, for, for a reason. They haven't needed it. Um, and they've sufficed with, you know, next generation GDR5X. Um, I just wonder if, if HBM was too much of an early bet for AMD. And, um, you know, that's that's part of, you know, the, the biggest part of the problem is is that memory architecture causing... A little bit more, certainly more expense, but certainly more power and heat, I think, to, to light up those pins. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, well, the guess... other thing, too, is um, <clears throat> we're not going to see Volta until next year. Um, Vega wasn't compelling enough for NVIDIA to, to push that up and release it sooner. Uh, Jensen, the CEO of NVIDIA, said recently, you know, for the holiday season, it's all about Pascal. So that's kind of the side effect, too, of, of AMD not putting out something a little faster yeah they've got it in uh in ai cards right in in uh um ai accelerators that he went and yes. sampled that out to some developers in that space so yeah Volta, i mean, Volta I mean for, for gaming cards he's talking about for the, right for the rest of this year it's all about yeah. pascal yeah no that was my point they, they could if they wanted to perhaps yeah all right do we want to move on can yeah. we beat this one? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got to be crisp about this, too. Let's talk about a couple of different uh, laptops. Paul, you took a look at the Origin Eon, a uh, GeForce GTX 1060-equipped 15-inch uh, machine. Is that it? Down a peg, down a peg. It's a 1050 Ti. Okay. Um, that's actually one of the knocks against this is that's the only GPU they offer on the Eon 15S. Um but you can get a faster GPU if you bump up to their Eon 15, I think it's called X. So they do have faster options, it's just a, a notch up on the laptop. Um, basically what this is, it's a 15.6 inch laptop from a boutique builder. It, it's 
really based on a, a Clevo design. Um, so they've they've taken one of those laptops and rebadged it and put their own support behind it. Like I think you have a 45 day uh, no bad pixel guarantee, lifetime support, and that kind of stuff. So there's some value there as far as getting a rebadge from a company that has good support like Origin does. Um, th the selling point here is that you're getting a laptop from a vendor like Origin PC without paying a huge premium. This one starts at $999. Uh, I don't know if pricing's changed since we looked at it, but when we reviewed it, it starts at $999. As configured, it bumped up the price to $1363. This one had an Intel Core i7 7700HQ processor, uh, the GTX 1050 Ti, 8GB of RAM, a 250 gigabyte Samsung 960 EVO NVMe SSD, so it's, it's a, one of the fast drives that goes over the PCIe bus. Uh, there's also a 1TB Seagate Firecuda uh, flash accelerated hard drive in there for bulk storage. Uh, and then the rest is pretty standard. You have the full HD webcam, 802.11 EC, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, um, an assortment of USB 3.1 and 3.0 ports, things like that. Uh, one unique thing that it does have on there that you don't see too often on gaming laptops is a fingerprint reader. Uh, you don't really see uh, too much in the way of biometric security, but it does have that here. Performance-wise, it... it it performed what you'd expect out of a 1050 Ti, which it held its own when you're gaming at 1080p. Um, and there's also headroom there for down the line. I mean, a couple of our benchmarks, we were posting you know, 70 frames per second on average. So there is some headroom there to grow. Uh, not as much, say, as if you were able to bump up to a 1060 or a 1070, which would be nice to see at this price point. Um, overall, it, it's a decent, uh, gaming laptop from a boutique builder that doesn't cost a ton. That said, if you were to skip Origin PC and go straight to the source, which I said it's like a Clevo or a Sager laptop, you can get it for a little bit cheaper. There's also, um, we compared it against Dell's Inspirion 15 7000 gaming laptop, which is similarly configured. I think it has a slower storage in there, but the specs are, you know, mostly the same, same GPU in that one, I think. And you can get that one for a few hundred dollars cheaper. So uh, there's some pros and cons on it, depending on, on what you're looking for. Sure, sure. I think that's what's interesting about about these guys like Origin that take a Sager or a Clevo machine um, and rebrand it, make it their own, certainly in terms of uh, maybe a little bit of a different styling aesthetic uh, badge or what have you. But more importantly, what they do is reconfigure the internals and optimize them for customers that they're that they're targeting for for their for their demographic and so something like that nvme solid state drive that you talked about that pm 961 that samsung drive i think that's what you said was in there yep. um that thing is super fast and you might not find that in just any oem you know sega or clevo whatever um so so there's you know it's it's about the config it's about you know like you say paul that a little bit of white glove boutique config and setup uh, and support that um, that gives you that little bit of extra value. Um, the the for, customization for the options too, like on this model, um, when I was looking at it online, you could double the amount of RAM from eight gigabyte to sixteen gigabyte for sixty bucks, which is you know that's not egregious. A lot of times when you're looking online uh, from bulk OEMs, they charge a lot more than you know what you think they should to upgrade something like the RAM. And if you want to go to name brand RAM. 8 gigabyte to 16 gigabytes at 61 so it's a dollar premium over whatever the default is in there and sure. also they have um custom paint jobs that are 250 bucks that are you know automotive um quality so if you want to if you want to make this a show quality laptop you can do that without spending too too much as well sure yeah so five pounds uh 15 inch uh 1080p gaming on high image quality at 60 frames per second in most games. Is that a fair, fair nice. assessment? Yeah, 1050 nice. Ti, not not the regular 1050. Right. Yeah, 1050 Ti. Yep. So four gig on the uh, on the memory there too. How was the display? The display was good. Um, I wish they'd offer a touchscreen option, just because you know with smartphones being so ubiquitous, we're kind of used to touch now. Yeah. Um, but it, it's a 1080p display. It's IPS, so it has good viewing angles. The Color was good and vibrant. Um, I think I measured it at 
300 nits brightness or somewhere around there. So it was, it was pretty decent. Sure, sure. Yeah, check it out. We have a review up on the site, the Origin PC Eon 15S with uh, GeForce GTX 1080 Ti, 7th generation Intel Cable 8 Core i7 7700HQ, 8 gig of RAM, all for right around 1000 bucks or uh, 1300 as tested, right? Yep. Starts at, that, a, starts at a grand and as configured, 1363 minus. Uh, I really wouldn't recommend paying for their their uh, wooden crate shipping because that's like a $41 charge. And really, that's the onus is on them to make sure it's shipped safely to you. So I don't I don't advocate paying extra for a wooden box. But if you want to, that option's there. Yeah, maybe you need to transport it later on so you'll pay for that. But yeah, and that, you know, that's a pretty much loaded for bare config uh, with, um, you know, that SSD as well as the one terabyte hard drive. So good stuff, good stuff. I want to show folks real quickly um, what I'm looking at in the uh, notebook space right now. And this is a device that I'm actually pretty excited about. I'm going to blow out the, the screen a little bit, but that's okay. This is the second generation <clears throat> Lenovo, hot off the press, Lenovo ThinkPad X1 Yoga with OLED. So this is this is the second iteration of the machine. Um, it has a beautiful 14-inch um, OLED display, 2560 by 1440 resolution. <clears throat> it has Intel Kaby Lake on board, PCI Express NVMe solid state drive. And it's been redesigned, so it's a little bit nicer uh, aesthetic here in terms of the material. It's a little bit flatter, shows fingerprints a little bit less. Key caps are um, also redesigned. Uh, I'm going to be looking at this in the weeks ahead, and it is uh, an exciting machine for me because I'll be very honest with you. It also does the yoga thing. I'll be very honest with you. If you were to ask me um, what is my favorite notebook for work as a daily driver to, to get work done on the road, it's this guy. It's the ThinkPad X1 series from, from uh, Lenovo. And lately, I've been loving this Yoga OLED. This is the second generation, so I'm looking forward to checking it out. Stay tuned to Hot Hardware for that review. Check out Paul's Eon 15 review. And finally, before we close, um, remind them, Marco, that we have a giveaway going on where they could win some really cool stuff. Yes, it's actually it's it's almost over. It's running to the basically the end of the month. We are giving away some awesome Ryzen goodies. Um, we have a, a Ryzen Seven eighteen hundred X CPU with motherboard and RAM. So and it's super easy to win. Come by the site, make some comments, make some friends, get noticed, and uh, you're going to be randomly entered. You have to like a couple of Facebook pages. Nothing crazy. But really, really cool stuff. If you want to upgrade your rig and get in on some of the AMD Ryzen goodness, hot hard your spot. Yeah, man, we, we <laughs> give away something almost every month, and uh, this this month uh, we're, we're doing the AMD thing and uh, getting people some rise and love. So that's good, good stuff. Uh, could be the basis for a really nice gaming PC. Uh, Vittorio Houston, I think I'm saying that correctly, says, Cipetta, Italiano? Of course. <laughs> Vittorio, you're amongst brothers here, my friend. <laughs> yes, lots of vowels at Hot Hardware. Yes, yes, I'm rather Italian myself. Uh, guys, it was a pleasure. It's been a while, and we should do this more often. Um, uh, any any parting words? What do you before we go? What are you excited about in in terms of what's coming for 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 product? Paul, two seconds. Uh, more stock of graphic cards across the <laughs> board. <laughs> Chris, uh, jeez, uh. <laughs> Smartphones. I don't know. I'm with Chris. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's I'm kind excited. of it's been a blur yeah, this year. So I don't even know what to look forward to next. Yeah. I definitely want to see what the eighteen core um the uh, Intel processor does. I've seen some preliminary benchmarks. Some of the overclockers are leaking some stuff on Facebook and the numbers look pretty sick. So we'll see how that looks. Well, I can tell you, yeah, I'm excited about a lot of things too. That's one of them. And I'm also excited about a couple of phones uh, that are coming. And there's one that I'm going to be looking at hopefully shortly, and that's the LG V30. And I can't say more about it because I'm under NDA, but I saw it, and yeah, like that thing. So there you go. Anyways, folks, thanks for joining us. We will catch you next time. Stop by hothardware.com. You can find us on facebook.com slash hothardware, twitter.com slash hothardware, youtube.com slash hothardware. We're everywhere. Sign up, subscribe. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Thanks for stopping by.